have with us these two incredible people from the Bible, Ananias and Paul. We are so glad you're here. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. I heard you high-fiving people. You say that quite a bit. It seems like it's a tagline. How'd you, how'd you come up with it, Paul? Well, well, hello. This technology. <laughs> Before COVID and before I was Paul, I was Saul. And I was, I was kind of a big deal with the Pharisees. I was known as a guy who got things done. I was a go-getter. Praise and peace. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, at that time, I was a go-getter. And when certain people of uh, our Jewish community started to make waves, well, I would go get them and I'd straighten them out. We call that uh, offering correction. If you know what I mean. Anyway, I'm not particularly proud of that time, especially because the idea of grace and peace was, was not a priority. Now, if you were listening to my, uh, my version of the story earlier, you, you would have heard about uh, I'm walking the road to Damascus, and I was going to offer some correction. And then the big light hits, and then Jesus is like, Saul, what's with all the persecution? And then I'm totally blind. I'm telling you, these biblical moments, they, they can leave quite an impression on you. But I would, I would say, even though that moment was big, that's not when uh, I learned about grace and peace. No, it was with my time communing with Ananias that I, uh, my life was transformed in a way of grace and peace. And that's, that's when I became Paul. Yes, I've always wondered about that name change. You know, you're, you're Saul, you're named after the first king of Israel, a pretty big person, big personality to choose to walk in. And then all of a sudden you're Paul. What, what, what did that change come about? Well, I don't know if you Episcopalians ever get a chance to read the Bible. But <laughs> if you do, you probably know that when God transforms people, names can change. So, for example, Abram became Abraham, and Jacob became Israel, and uh, Sarai became Sarah. Very nice name. Now, I was Saul, which is a Hebrew name, that it was a royal name, and it means uh, the one who's asked for or prayed for, a big deal. By comparison, I became Paul, which is a Roman name, which means small, humble, the least, which I think I personally quite like, it. and uh, it, it's because I know I'm just a small part of God's greater, wonderful plan, but I changed, so my name changed. And now I'm, I'm humbly enthusiastic to follow the way of Jesus and to offer up small bits of grace and peace. Well, it seems like this experience of encountering each other and feeling Jesus drawing you together changed both of you. And I was to say what that was like to get to draw near to somebody who probably was a little bit dangerous to you. I think you hit the nail on the head, Sarah. Thanks for having us here. I mean, Saul and I would never have been friends. And I think for me, I was I was a little scared. You know, like Saul was known to be a threat, a real big threat. We were trying to just live in community. And then you know what God told me to do? God told me to go and reach out exactly to him. And so I think I deepened in prayer. I thought it was a pretty prayerful person following this way of Jesus. And I knew from every step there was going to be resistance. There was going to be um, hardship. Not, I didn't think it was going to be this dramatic. But that just increased my prayer. Um, it really, really opened me up to hearing more about the clarity of what God was calling for me to do exactly in that moment. Not just in general, but exactly right there. What did God need me to do? And Paul, you were put on this path of not just an instant of change, but that, that living into this was a gradual thing, a realization and a, a dawning. What was it like being with Ananias and his disciples in Damascus in the days after they prayed for you and you were healed? What did it feel like? Well, well to begin with, as Ananias uh, was saying, when I got there, things were a little tense. And frankly, I was a hot mess. I couldn't see, I was disoriented, I was hungry, hadn't been for days, and people were like leading me around like, like a small child. Like, I, I was hopeless. But you know, it's, it's, it's moments like 
that when your life is at a low point, that a little grace and peace can be transformational. So, like, Ananias laid hands on me, and scales came off my eyes, and it was a little gross, but still, it was awesome because I could see, and I was, I was so, so grateful. And then Ananias and the other uh, friends, disciples, they, they kept me and they fed me. And I got, as I got stronger and stronger, stronger, I became more and more grateful. And then I could see, really see, that grace and peace is not a state, but it's an action. And that grace and peace can spring from anyone, anywhere. And that God is working with us, among us, and through us. I can see that grace and peace is is capable if you're open to it anywhere. You know, falling from your eyes, that sounds like something pretty frightening. That doesn't happen. I, you had that happen? You were surprised. Yeah. So, so, so Ananias, what surprised you most? I mean, you all had kind of this obvious watershed. How were you surprised by this experience of God changing the connection with the two of you? It's a good question because I think like for Paul, it wasn't just that one moment. So one thing that surprised me, which I should have known already, you know that God speaks to me in my visions, God speaks to me, and I shouldn't not trust that. Two, I was also surprised that the change and the transformation and being led into drawing us more into community was more than just that moment. Right? That I could be a vessel of whatever God wanted to do, whether or not I agreed with it or not. And I put my hands on him, and, and literally God was doing all the work. And after that moment, it was our work to continue to invite people into our community, like we had been. He just happened to have been Saul. But I needed to clear my head of who he formerly was and who God, and be open to who God was making him right now. Well, Paul, you had this huge epiphany, right? This, this moment of everything changing and you could see the world in a new way, but then you had to go into the ordinariness of daily life where there's, you know, things that happen, the nitty gritty, having to problem solve, having to, to be involved in those spaces that don't flow effortlessly. So what did it take learning how to trust how Jesus was moving you, setting into all kinds of places in the Roman Empire and to be with people and to help them see what God was doing in their lives? Yeah, you know, you're right. Like, it was a bit of a slog. I, I got to tell you, there's a lot of walking, a lot of meeting people, a lot of organizing. There was some letter writing, and uh, no, I got to say that uh, not everyone in God's church was getting along. There were some arguments and, and, and debates going on, and it could be a little bit rugged. Don't even get me started on the Corinthians. I'm telling you, but there was a lot. But that's life. But it's what I learned road to Damascus, and with my time with Ananias, about communi communicating, and especially the transformational nature of grace and peace, well, that made all the difference. But it wasn't just about me teaching other people about Jesus' way and organizing. I was drawn into something bigger. In my travels, I actually found being a part of other people's transformations was like a symbiotic encounter, a symbiotic experience. As you listen to people without judgment, and as you work together to be part of God's love, you are drawn into a spirit that is bigger than yourself. It's like the grace of God gets reflected back on you from other people, and it's bigger than before. So while my ministry was hard work, like life, it was personally rewarding and very spiritually fulfilling time. Well, we're in change and renewal and transformation, asking where are these things God is inviting us to notice and to see in new ways. And I'm curious, given what you've lived through and the perspective you have this many years later, what what's some encouragement that you have for us here at St. Paul's Burling Cave? And I just want to go first. Sure, sure. Um, I love the gospel that you all listened to and read today, the Sermon on the Mount. She just goes up that mountain and basically draws really big extremes. Paul and I, were, or Saul, excuse me, Saul and I were really in two very extremely different places in our life. And because of our faith in God, 
communities or the stances, if you will, that are so far from where you think you are? How do you draw closer? How does this community draw closer and closer to the ones who you think are so opposite? If you're mourning, they're not. If you're happy, they're not. How do you all do that? I don't know if that's necessarily it. That's Reverend Sarah, but it really is this question that continues to draw on my experience with Saul, that he reminds me that God will never draw you astray, and I need to be really, really brave to take those steps closer and closer to trying to find a relationship so close that I'm touching someone this close for healing. Thank you. Paul, you get the last word. You had a lot of words. Well, I guess, you know, I know life is not always all trees and puppy dogs. People can be unkind. There are atmospheric rivers. There's inflation. Alas, there's gun violence. Life can be challenging. But I would say, keep a little grace and peace in your back pocket. When things get tough, if you can start a response with a, just a bit of grace and peace, then you are involving God in the equation. God is with you. And acting with grace and peace may just open somebody else's eyes. Be a part of somebody else's transformation. Not by preaching, but just by humbly offering up a little Paul-sized bit of grace and peace. All right, that's great advice. Thank you both for being here. We look forward to getting to hang out with you 